talking about three reasons why you should become a Python freelancer or a Python developer. And um, let's hope that there are no more technical issues because we've been having technical issues for the last hour. No, no, the dashboard isn't loading. <laughs> and the dashboard isn't loading. And uh, we sincerely hope that things don't crash. But if they don't crash, we're going to be good to go. Okay, we're live. We've got nine people on here so far. Hopefully that increases in a little bit. Awesome. Great. Class for today. Go and, watch. <laughs> and uh, if the audio is working and you can just let us know that the audio is working, that would be phenomenal. So let's talk about why somebody should become a Python freelancer. Why do you think, Aaron? Ooh. Why should it's somebody... the best job in the world, that's why. The best job in the world? Yeah. What else? Okay, that, that's a pretty big claim. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good claim. Yeah, I'd rather be like, you know, like a celebrity or something, but uh, actually I wouldn't. But um, I mean, like any freelancer, of course you have your own time. You can work on your own time. You can work from um, wherever you want. Well, actually, no. I mean, only like software freelancers or like, or like online freelancers can work from wherever they want. Like if right. you're just a freelancer in general, sometimes you have to, you're still like location bound. But because you're a developer plus a freelancer, like that combination, you can work from wherever you want, uh, whenever you want, and the pay is actually pretty damn good. And it's right. fun too. Like coding is fun and you feel like a badass or a retard half the time. Half the time. Yeah. That's interesting, yeah. <laughs> Synonymous, right? Um, okay, hopefully these work. So let's write some of these down. Yeah. Okay. So, um, is it going to let me write ever? Or do I just start typing? Okay, there we go. All right, so let's, uh, let's change the size to make it like size 22. Okay, so why become a developer? Especially, why become a developer? Oh, the chat is popping. Let me see. It's working? Yeah, yeah. Well, just a bunch popped up. We're at 44 already, bro. Oh, wow.
Hello. Yep, it's picking up. Okay, great. So the audio is back. Hello. Testing, testing. Beautiful. Yeah. Make sure you're in the camera. So I just lean in. <laughs> yeah, just lean in and type. All right. Let's see what's Okay. Hey, yeah. Cool. They can hear us. Okay, perfect. Sounds great. Sounds great. Where is the laptop? Right here. Sorry, guys. Just setting a few things up so then the rest of the live stream can hopefully run a little bit smoothly. All right. So hopefully you guys can see me right now completely and can hear me completely so that would be great i'll turn this off don't need it anymore awesome so for me in the start it was all about like income 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 like that was my biggest goal right i would oh. should we start over since they heard nothing from the beginning no they heard from the beginning they just weren't hearing for a little bit oh got it audio's back beautiful okay thank you guys so for me it was like okay how much money do developers or python developers make and i would i would look up things and i'd be like okay according to guru or dax.com what are they making so all right average python developer salary in the u.s and why is python so popular the average python developer salary in the u.s is one hundred and ten thousand dollars a year that's six figures guys According to Guru, <laughs> New York and California have the highest Python developer salary of $122,000 to $121,000 accordingly. Let's see if it's showing the correct thing. Great. And then according to Indeed, the average Python programmer salary is $123,000 a year. Okay. And uh, these regions in the U.S. are high color coded by salary Green. so the purple you are the less income you make Oklahoma. and apparently this is not even 90k this is just less than 90 dollars <laughs> oklahoma makes less than 90 dollars <laughs> yeah, i didn't notice that so you have oklahoma here then the other ones you got 90 to 100k range the yellow ones are 100 to 110 k range and then the green ones like california washington new york and virginia are the 110 k plus range basically no matter what state you're in you can make that much money <laughs> it's kind of all the same yeah python trends in 2019 and does it continue to be one of the hottest skill and uh i think they stole this from me actually did they really yeah because i was the original one who I mean, okay, they could have not stolen it from me, you know, but my ego is coming in and I'm like, because <laughs> I did create a webinar once and I had this. So Python is definitely one of the most uh, wanted languages. And this is according to a Stack Overflow post. So, so it's not something that we're kind of coming up with here. But Stack Overflow saves engineers all throughout the world billions of engineering hours, which is very very helpful and according to them they're like hey you should probably learn python because it's the most wanted or one of the most wanted ones the what most that? yeah that looks actually fascinating what the hell is this it's like some kind of uniform distribution or something yeah so they have all these programming languages starting from cobol huh. and i think that's all the way down here that's so like binary there, yeah, so it's like more supply is all about the bottom and more demand is at the top. So oh, so the redder, so it's like Python is kind of getting in the redder area over Which is here. actually where you want to be, right? Right. Yeah. Source dice. Another way to see the progress of Python is to study the PyPL popularity of programming language index. There's also the Toby index which monitors the frequency of searches for different programming language tutorials. In 2019, Python became the most popular programming language to learn, 
showing an almost 17 percent growth over the last five years we probably had a we had we had a little percentage of that like the 17.1 we were probably a portion of that yeah i i think so <laughs> we yeah probably like maybe we like, got a chunk of that yeah like then mosh jumped on it yeah and then everybody else jumped on it like but okay look python trends or no not google trends right what oh google? yeah yeah how, yeah, how does Python stack against every other language, not just JavaScript? Right. Because we did that last time. Yes. I'm curious. So last time I had it and we had uh, JavaScript. Let's type in Python. So I'm going to search for programming language, not just a search term. Because search term is a snake could be Python. So we're going to do programming language. And then we'll add in JavaScript here. And if you look at the two uh, over, let's say, the last five years, you'll notice Python is a blue one. So you'll notice that Python kind of started with less interest. And then over time, it grew more and more and more interest. And now it actually has a greater interest, according to Google Trends, in as, as a programming language. Mm -hmm. Okay. We got some comments coming in. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, what about C language? Pop in C and see how it stacks up to C. <laughs> yeah, let's. Python versus C. C, I think, might actually be more popular, but let's see. Hmm. Let's see. Maybe, maybe. It's not coming because up. a lot, of, a lot of operating systems and low-level stuff is based in C. I mean, Python is based on C. Uh, C is not coming up. C++ maybe? So we can look up C++. But C. <laughs> oh, God. It's way down there. Put lifetime. I wanted, I'm want i curious because like, like long time ago, like 2004, Depressed. maybe C++ was winning at the beginning. Damn, look at that. JavaScript, JavaScript was killing it in 2004. C++ and then Python is coming in for the home run. Ooh, Python is Let's sneaky. Let's just start adding in like one language at a time and just be like, <laughs> yeah, Python's on top. <laughs> Wait, what other language? Ruby, I Java. mean, Ruby might have more. I mean, actually, I don't I don't think Ruby has. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow. Java. Python. <laughs> Python's on top, yo. Python's on top. Okay, let's look at Java. Dominating. Oh, my face is blocking a lot of it. Oh, oh yeah, and OBS. <laughs> yeah. Look, even Java. Java is losing the Python too. Look at it's the cloud. It's like. Pew. It's up there. It's <laughs> Java is fighting with JavaScript. <laughs> okay. Did I hide it? I think I did finally, right? Yo, what's up, Zachy? Just assume like the bottom, bottom right. Um, yeah, bottom right is. Is this live? Yup, this is live, Leo. What's yeah, guys, on? this is live. What's up, Sharath, Anil, Zaki, Vela, Leo. Salmon Quan. I don't know. What that <laughs> Damn, is. Leo. Why? Why do you have so much hate against Tech Lee? <laughs> Should I show it? No, 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 no. All, all like hate comments and stuff. Like, don't show them. And, Come on, Leo. Yeah. Oh, dude, I almost... Holy crap, feel this. Did you just slice yourself open? I feel like I have the biggest paper cut that's ready to be... Feel it. Oh, that, that, freaks, that shit freaks me out, man. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> what happened? How? Oh, shit. I have, like, the craziest paper cut. So that's kind of what's going on on this end, right? Like, you look at the trends now... So, you know, the trends tell you a lot. So, you know, let's go back and <laughs> pop in Python, not just a developer, but Python freelance developer. Yeah. And I think the reason for that is um, Python just is so versatile, you know, like you can do web development with it and websites are getting there's more and more businesses over time. So there needs to be more web developers. Um, you can do machine learning with it and big data, and there's more and more of that coming up as we go into the future, and it's not going to slow down, and Python is a very, very popular language, if not the most popular for that. There might be some like weird 
convoluted languages, but I mean Python, like you got like a lot of machine learning libraries and open um, some open source libraries for like doing just machine learning and big data kind of stuff. So it's good for that, and it's very easy to learn. It's just it's just the most well-rounded language, pretty much. Yeah, but so, you can't do mobile. But I mean, <clears throat> flutter's coming in. Right, so you can you you can't while you can't do mobile, right? But what you would do with something like Python is, for example, if I wanted to build a iOS app, I would use the Django like REST API, and using that, I would build the mobile app. Yeah, because it actually turns out pretty nicely. It's right. just a web web app. That's the beauty about web apps too, yeah, because then it works on any device pretty well. Yeah, and I would use the Django REST API to make the back end, and mm -hmm. then I would just use Flutter to create the front end. Yeah. And it would just query my API for all the data that it needs. Yeah, we did that with our code daddy's list, right? Um, or we, Craigslist scraper. Yeah, but we didn't do we Flutter. Yeah, we didn't use Flutter. Yeah, but we did. We also didn't create like a Django REST framework, but like oh, yeah, a we API, That's right. yeah. If we did create an API, then we could use Flutter or whatever we wanted. Dope. Right. So the the Django backend is pretty awesome. So like for example, while it can't exactly do mobile development, but if you use the backend, then it then it can do mobile. <laughs> Man, do something for the Muslims. Mobile development. <laughs> Native applications are so much better than hybrid ones, though. Yeah, maybe true. I mean, if you if you keep it separated, it's easier to be more tailored um, because you can have like one mobile version and one um, native version. But I can't see anything. There we go. Okay. Um, okay, guys, everybody keep the chat clean because we're going to block your face. Okay, can you make an e-commerce website, Aaron says. So, um, an e-commerce website? Yeah, absolutely. So, let, let's talk about it, right? E-commerce website with Python. So, can you make an e-commerce website with Python? Is there a website emoji we have? So can you make an e-commerce website with Python? You absolutely can. It's let's talk about what are the things that you need to make a e-commerce website. So what is something that you need? Um, well, you're going to need the back end to hold all of like the product data and the images and the prices and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And of course, back, back, you need a back end, which we can build with Python. What mm -hmm. else do we need? So we need a we need a check. Uh, how about like a add to cart type of functionality? Oh, like that kind of stuff. Got it. Like even getting even more. Yeah. So we can do um, product listings. Yeah. So like a list of products and product yep. data on the back end. You're gonna be need to be able to create an account. Mm -hmm. Create an account with that. So um, Python. Yeah. The Django uh, admins login feature. Uh, you need to be able um, to accept payments. Mm -hmm. Accept payments. What else? Mm, a cart option. Uh, yeah. What else? Uh, oh, some way to com. Well, no, you don't need communication for e-commerce websites. I mean, yeah. you could. You could have it where you. We can, don't like, need the communication. So, like regular, le regular websites, like regular e-commerce websites. You know, you there. Go through the products and you add the cart and then you buy. Right. Yeah. Oh, shipping options. That's not really related to software development. No, well, there are already services for that. You're not going to create that from scratch. So we can do product listings. We can create an account, payments, cart. What other things do we need to care about if we're building an e-commerce website? Security. Oh, yeah, yeah, security. Well, I mean, for payments, you mean like secure payment? Secure payments, creating account securely. Oh, just security um, in general. Other people right. can't log into your account and delete your listings. Mm, that kind of stuff. Right. Got it. So. Fair point. An e-commerce website with Python. Well, 
Uh, can we make product listings using Python? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, just back end some back end some front end stuff. A picture, yeah. price. Yeah, so for some of the stuff you're gonna need HTML CSS. For some stuff you might even need JavaScript, but for most of this, if you use Django, you can actually build it without using much of JavaScript at all. And it's okay to use JavaScript to help what you're building. It's not like you don't use any other language at all. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason why we're fans of Python is because of its flexibility, not necessarily we're religious to it. You know, it's exclusive. If it stops being practical, I'm gonna stop talking about python and i'm going to be talking about the next programming language so we can do all of these things that you see here with python so i will and and so yeah you can definitely build an app with you can definitely build an app with python okay like an e-commerce website Okay. Let's see what else. How does Python speed compare to JavaScript backend using Node? JS Node. Okay, Zaki says I'm quite confused on how you're supposed to store account data in a web in a database. I usually just hash them. Is there a better approach? So, Zaki, one thing I recommend in how do you use account data? Or how do you store pe user data? Like how to store user data. Um, what I recommend for this is in Django, try to use the built-in user model and try to use those built-in models as much as you can because they allow you to store that data without you having to do much and they do it securely so they'll they will hash the the passwords and everything for you and they will do a lot of those things automatically and then extend it as needed and that should do a pretty good job of keeping the data of users secure mm -hmm. account data track customer location is possible yeah i guess tracking that could be useful in the app if you're doing e-commerce yeah, tracking exactly, Aaron. Yeah, tracking customer location is definitely helpful as well. Volume is is the volume low, guys. We can definitely turn it up. Yeah, I saw that, but I mean. Hello, hey guys. Hey, hello, hello. Okay, so I think that should be enough to explode your ears. <laughs> right in the red. Oh, blockchain development. I am opting for blockchain development. Hold on. I don't like this one. Um, okay. Also considering payments, is it better to just interact with Visa or MasterCard API or should I use middleware libraries such as Stripe? So for... Okay. So when it comes to... Oh, by the way, um, we have our Profitable Programmer courses available. Uh, um, we just opened it actually a few days ago, and we'll be closing it when? Like two days, three days? No, early bird ends today in 17 hours. The okay, so the early bird pricing ends for the Profitable Programmer course today uh, at midnight. So if any of you are interested in joining Profitable Programmer, Definitely check it out. Can you drop the link in the chat so people yeah, can see it? And then we'll drop it in the description too if you're watching this afterwards. Right. Um, I'll just put it here to join profit. Can I pin this? Yeah, you can pin it. There's no option to. No option to? Okay. Okay. Can you add it to the description of the chat? Probably not, right? Yeah. You know what's funny is it says excellent connection. And <laughs> even with the other laptop, it never said excellent connection. I've never <laughs> seen that. Okay, so if you're using how to... All right, I'm just going to write that right here. Uh, 
let's see, early bird ends in like tonight. Yeah, in like seventeen hours. Yeah, so if you if you want, you can definitely look into this program or think about joining it. But let's continue with everything we're talking about here. So how do you actually? So we've talked about how to store data, how to store user data. Let's talk about how to accept payments in your Python app. And really, yes, you could use middleware. Yes, you could use the Visa card and the MasterCard API, but don't because that's why one of the best, you know, merchants ever were built, was built, which is Stripe. So use Stripe um, and use PayPal. Is there, there's like a Stripe API or something or? Oh yeah, of course. You just put it in there? I yeah. I've never actually used that specifically in an app stripe api so i have so like you have a stripe python api ding 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 that was easy right <laughs> one google search done and so you just choose which one you want python node.js go they have go okay and it's as simple as this to charge somebody, right? So you can charge a card. It asks for some kind of specific, you know, key. You give it the API key, and then you can save that charge. So a specific charge ID, and then there you go. Okay. Hmm. And that's how simple it is to get started with it. I am actually using a uh, Stripe API for one of the apps I've built. What is this? Nitin Whoa. 40 something? We just got 40 something. I don't know what that is. What kind of currency is this? It's a Thunderbolt currency? <laughs> the Pikachu. The Superman currency? It's Pokemon currency. Oh. Okay, oh, so. 40 Indian. Oh, it's the Indian rupee sign. Okay, so what's 40 rupees? I think that's 4 cents, right? 40 cents. Oh. Thank you so much. I appreciate Like, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. That's amazing. Um, okay, so let me continue. Thank you for that, Nitin. All right, let's see what is happening. Let's see. What other? <laughs> I don't have interest in coding. What should I do with Python in the future? Um, <laughs> if, uh, if you don't have interest in coding, I joined the club. Yeah, if you so if you don't have interest in coding, then don't do anything with coding. Like stay. <laughs> Oh wow, yeah. chat revenue, 56 cents. It says right there. Dang. I love that, thank you guys. Okay, so what's happening here? I'm gonna go through some previous questions. Yeah, there was a couple up top, actually. I think you should think of, so Abdul Salam says, I think you should think of coding languages as tools. Some tools will be better at doing things than other tools. Just use what fits the screw head. Yeah, so a lot of what you can think about when it comes to programming languages is that there are tools designed to help you. Okay, it's not, it's not that you have to be religious to one programming language. It's more about, okay, figure out what's the tool that helps you, what's something that helps you go farther. Maybe like, for example, if I'm building an app with Python, but then I need to do mobile development, right? I might actually build that app out on my phone. And then for my phone, I can't be using Python. So I'll build it using Flutter, right? If I have to make my apps front end really, really good and make it really fast and have like, capability to do Ajax and do all this stuff like I'm going to use React or I'm going to use something like JavaScript to maybe improve the interface. So I'm not really religious to what programming language I use. I try to use whatever is needed to do the job. Yep. I, mean, I just prefer I just prefer to be using Python wherever I can. Okay. 
So hopefully that answers that question. Yeah. Pandas or Django, which is better? Both. You can't really compare them too much. Pa pa yeah, Pandas is a library. <laughs> yeah, Django is a framework. Right. So <laughs> a data, yeah, it's, you, it's hard. I mean, you can use Pandas with Django, you know, to do data analysis. Both. <laughs> yeah. Um, Internet of Things using Python. Um, okay, hold on. Okay. After learning oh, object-oriented programming in Python, cool projects with Tkinter, is it good to jump to web development with Django? Mm. Yeah, for sure. So if you are doing, if you did object-oriented programming, right? Object-oriented programming. And you know the answer is yes, you should, because um, object-oriented programming is really, really like local development is really, really good to get you the principles of how development works without having to deal with the complexity of the internet. Because you're not like if you're doing local development, you're not worrying about hey, like is my request working? Is my network working? You're only yeah. You know, you're only, it's very... You have full control and yeah. everything's self-contained in its own and safe environment. Yeah. Yeah. There's no, exactly, there's yeah. no other environment affecting you. Mm -hmm. It's everything is self-contained. So... It's like you're at home, you know, you don't have to worry about the world. And then when you step out the door... Yeah. You got to <laughs> deal with the <laughs> sun. Goes shit. Yeah. And so this is the main thing when it comes to local development or just purely doing something on your desktop working with Tekinter or whatever it's really good to get your skills up without worrying about outer complexity and then later you add an additional layer of complexity with web development so definitely take it one step at a time if you can well kevin roman is asking if you join the course and pay uh -huh. uh, for the payment plan and you don't like it can you get a refund yeah. So if you if you join the profitable programmer course, it's sixty day money back. But don't like don't jump in with the bad attitude because you won't do well. Mm -hmm. So if you're gonna jump in, like jump in fully on, and and for in order for you to get a refund, like you have to actually show you were putting in work in week zero, week one, week two, week three. Yeah. Uh, because otherwise there will be no refund if you don't do the work. Like if you jump in just to like, because some people will try to do that, right? They'll jump in to just look at the course or download the material so then they can use it for free. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, okay, then they also get a refund on that. Mm -hmm. And so we don't encourage those people to come in. We encourage people who are serious about growing their business, their income, because otherwise don't jump in. It's not helpful for you. Okay, so what other question? Apply. How to apply? Zaki says, I've seen that you learn libraries quite fast, such as Flutter. Do you um, do you just read the docs or what do you do? I mean, to be honest, like I. Tr it's a mixture of a few things. So f one, I just go through the basic tutorials of learning what I'm like, I'm, I'm just, you know, like, for example, how did you learn Django for the first time like that? Oh, Django? I, I went through the documentation. That's what I did. They have a tutorial there. Yeah, so I followed a tutorial, like a course. Oh, like an actual course. Yeah, I followed a course, and then I built the app that that person was like, uh, what's his name? Coding for Entrepreneur. Mm, sounds familiar. Yeah, he has really great courses on this, on Django. And then I just followed his tutorials, and then... I went off and built my own stuff from his tutorial. Yeah, that's the most important thing. Yeah, like you can start in one spot. Like I think we 
you would start in one spot just to like get your feet wet but then after that like don't get sucked into tutorial purgatory like try to come up with like your own idea and then play around and figure it out yourself like piece by piece instead of just finally copying code off of a video and pasting it in and feeling good about yourself because you will learn that way but not nearly as fast as if you just like oh i have this idea like oh i want to integrate this into this e-commerce website payment thing or i want to make it secure and you just look into it and you figure it out um because that's actually what it's going to be like when you're working on a real job you're going to want to um whatever your client is needing and asking for they're going to be telling you they're going to have a long list of things and you're going to go through it and there's not going to be a tutorial for you to go watch that exact project you got to learn how to figure it out yourself so try to come up with your own ideas that you enjoy that are like fun and just make it happen because yeah. when your client needs wants to pay you like you just need to make what the client wants happen in order to get paid so i think right. it's better to do it that way right and so yeah if you are building out like your own projects from following other people's tutorial that's one of the best ways to learn the new library or the new framework or whatever it is you're trying to learn i try to follow a tutorial that's very easy to follow and then i try to go and stem off from there building my own thing so for example for, for flutter i was just using their their main tutorial which is on their platform so what you know and i was just following it literally from here and get started i made sure i set everything up i mean the amount of skill it takes just to install flutter and like start coding on it is actually remarkable like <laughs> you i just i feel like so many people especially if you're new to coding like 99 percent of the people will fail and won't even get past like hello world on flutter really mm -hmm. i haven't <laughs> done much with it like just to get it started just to get it installed just to get it like working get everything set up it just takes so much effort but uh, that's kind of disappointing python is like python <laughs> start <yeah. laughs> done right and i and i wish replit has something on flutter because replit is great but i don't think they have i don't think they have anything on flutter are they gonna surprise us no yeah. they don't they even have stuff on react uh they got Ruby. They, they got, got stuck on Java, Note. Right? They got stu stuff on Node.js, but they don't have Flutter yet. So I will. How do I learn frameworks? Okay. That's mainly, that's mainly what I do. Okay. Is it too late to start in your thirties? Guys, I'm a freelancer in a completely different field. It's fun and rewarding sometimes, but I just feel like I'm ready to try something new. Question, is it too late to start in your thirties? Ahmed asks. Hmm. So, it depends, but we have like a, our, our student, his name is Donnie and he's a 50, he's 59 years old and he started as a web developer, uh, just last year. So, I mean, it's all, it's always going to be too late and it's always that, ex, that reason for almost whatever it is that you do will always be there. But if you if you want to put it into perspective, you know, somebody who's 15 doesn't start. Like, I remember I didn't want to start working out at 15 because I thought it was too late. Because there were kids who were working out since 12. And they were already so much better athletically than I was. So, at 15, I didn't work out. I was the same way, actually. Yeah. yeah. I totally forgot about that. But that's how I felt when in high school. I was like, I didn't want to work out. I was like, oh, my friends were working out for three years. Like, I'm so skinny. And like, yeah. uh and then like 17, 18, <laughs> 19, and you finally start hitting the gym and then you're like, at, at, at some point, yeah. like, you know, the Hodge twins, you got, yeah. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the fitness, but there's these two guys called the Hodge twins they are super funny. 
they're fitness guys and they're super jacked. They didn't start working out until they're like 24, but now they're like 30 and like ripped as hell. Yep. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. They I didn't they start working out until they were 24. Or like some, I don't know the exact number, but it's a surprising age. You like, I assume they started when they were like 18. Yeah. When did the Hodgkins start? <laughs> Build muscle and get in shape. There's a video there. These are the guys. Two million subscribers. You got two million. Yeah, they're doing like comedy shows now because they're funny. Kevin Hodge. Th think of them as a Blair Witch project of the fitness world. That's funny. Black workout routine? Is that what it says? <laughs> uh, yeah, back workout routine. Okay, I can't see. Oh, they're 42 now? Yeah. Lift smart, not big. Yeah. So, it, dep it again, it's when do you, when you start. It's a good question to think about. But most important is like thinking two to five year terms. And if you're going to be 32 or you're going to be 35, and if this skill set is something you have and you're earning an income from it, would it be worth it for you? Would you enjoy it? That's the question you should ask yourself. And if you would, then it's worth it to actually jump on and start on this, right? Then you should go and jump on and be like, okay, I'm going to start coding now. And by the time I'm 31, 32, 33, mm -hmm. I will have this skill. Because the alternative is that you just won't have to skill. <laughs> yeah, you'll be 33 asking the same question. Right. Is it too late? Well, yeah. It's too late to become a software developer by 33, but not by 35. Exactly. So it's too late if you think it is. It's also not too late if you don't think it is. Mm. So think in three to five year terms. You're very young. 30 is very, very young because you could be 40 and you still have another lifetime ahead of you another 40 years another 40 years ahead of you you know so it's not late at all passive income with python making hmm, licensed softwares writing blogs where this one any ways to make passive income with Python, making licensed softwares, writing blogs? Yes, there's ways to make quote unquote passive income with everything except what you think about as passive income is not passive income. So there is no such thing as passive income. Um, and the reason why I say that is because people think passive income is equal to easy income. <laughs> yeah false assumption and um there's no such thing as this it's it doesn't exist there's no because i mean if you're, if you're talking about making a licensed software essentially you're talking about almost like a SaaS. so if you're building a software as a service with python there's no passive in it like you're gonna build it you're gonna be updating it and then you're gonna be doing it over and over again um it's very rare that you actually build something that generates some kind of real income that's actually useful, right? Like Tech Lead talks about some software that he's built, but he made he makes such little money from it. It's might as well have not built it in the first place. Yeah, I think um, I saw a video of his like a while back. Like he created like a some kind of like photography like stitching thing and then it brings in like how much does it bring in? Tech uh, like not as much as you would think. Yeah. I, I can't remember it exactly, but this was like three years ago. All right, well, this title is uh, okay. right, so let's see. Contrary, so there's some, there you go. Yeah, I don't know, does he have it in because I don't want to go through the whole video? Panel apps, right there, yeah, yeah. So, panel apps is one tool that he's built. Uh, there's some other tool. And then I'm not exactly sure what this is. Image details. I think it's panel apps images. Like you can 
how much earnings he gets. Yeah. So like people can like input their like a video or something, and then it spits out an image of that video into image form. So they yeah. just upload a video, and then it just gives you back an image. Right. For money. Yeah. So you can like if you again if you build a lot of these applications, even this application that he's built with panel apps or whatever it is, like you're not actually making that much income without having to do any work at all. Like you have to update it. You have to make sure that it's running. You have to make sure it's something that people are using. And if somebody else makes that th same thing that you're looking to build, well then you're not gonna get paid for what it is that you have, right? So there isn't any kind of passive as in you do it and then you're just kind of out. But for sure you can build licensed software, right? Like JetBrains makes PyCharm and I use PyCharm and I pay JetBrains for the service of PyCharm. And then lots of companies purchase PyCharm and use it as well. Mm. Hi, Isabel. <laughs> oh, hi, Isabel. <laughs> Team Kazi. Saying hi. <laughs> <laughs> From the girls all over the world. Nice. Oh, well. Love it. Isabel's our friend. Yeah. She's on Team Clever Programmer. Volume is still too low? Huh. Mm, I don't I believe that. it's probably on their side, yeah. It's probably, check your mic or something, man. I mean, your your headphone jack or whatever. Your speakers. Yeah, better to start right now with Python. Thanks for answering. Yep, you got mm -hmm. it. Django developer without degree. He doesn't have a degree. Right, so <laughs> I'm also a Django developer without a degree. So yeah, you, it could be helpful for you, but if you are trying to do freelancing and you're trying to become a software developer, it's not necessary. Like experience, experience trumps degree no matter what. It's uh, it's just because your degree could give you experience. That's like right and like resources, but I mean you can get it from anywhere. So doesn't really matter if you have a degree or not right just if you have the experience and the knowledge uh in the last two years i just broke one million dollars um in the last two and a half years and i don't have a college degree so i'm i have a very bad gp i had a bad gp in oakton community college i had a 2.0 gp in oakton community college i got a 19 on my act a lot of my friends around me were like yo even monkeys would get a better ACT. So I never actually told my friends what I got on my ACT, high school ACT exam. Lower than a monkey, apparently. Yeah, but um, I did break $1 million in the last two and a half years. And, you know, if you look at the timeline, 2015, I learned how to code. Uh, 2014, I learned how to code. Then 2015, I was making about sixty to seventy thousand dollars in a year. Then 20, you know, 2016, I made. Let me let me write this down. I guess so. 2015 learned. 2014 learned, coding. Uh, 2015, uh, did about 60k. Something like that, 60K or 80K, something like that. 2016, I did 104K that year. And then 2017, I did uh, 211K, about 2018, 350K, and then 2019 we've already done 350k and we're probably on track for 500 400 500 maybe but we'll see so on track for you know 400k plus right so if you just actually add up the last two and a half years that's over a million dollars but it all started from learning the skill of coding so i learned to code and then i started making income now, I don't have uh, a college degree. I am not planning on getting a college degree. But I just know that I have a goal, I have a vision, and then I just execute on it. 
you know? So when it comes to like, I learned the skill set of coding and the first things that helped me make my income were, you know, first I made my income from teaching coding and that helped me get to about 80K, close to 80K a year. And then the second thing was freelance with code. And that helped me get to 100K plus a year. And then it was, um, I realized that there's so much demand for coding and then I started teaching coding. And so that could be the next step for somebody who's wants to become a developer, right? You could first learn coding, then you could teach it to other people and charge for it. Then you can freelance with coding and then you could actually teach coding at scale, right? So teach coding online is what helped me scale to over 300K uh, plus a year. So because if you're teaching coding online and you're helping other people become freelancers and other people become developers, well, you're helping many, many different people throughout the world. And so then it only makes sense that you're making a higher income and you have a bigger impact in the world. You make more income and you have bigger impact. But, you know, it's, if I go here, all started in 2014 with me learning to code you know as it's 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 that <clears throat> where should anyone register to teach coding and how how to turn ideas to real world applications uh, oh just to mention, just mention the platform so we mentioned them plenty of times before but yeah so there are m lots of different platforms you could be using right you could be using Upwork or Wiseant or Take Lessons, and those are all platforms you could use to register and apply. And those are those are great. Okay, those are great platforms. You got it, bro. There you go. To do freelance with web living on Python. To do web dev, just yeah, learn Python and Django. Go on, start there. Yeah, start with Python and Django, and then you'll be well on track. She's yeah, team member and a regular spectator. Oh, Isabel, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How to turn ideas into real world applications? Well, you want to code something up, and then you want to. Uh, make it you know code it <laughs> like i don't know what yeah. i don't know what that um, means yeah just google like google your ideas like you got to think about it and then um you code it and then it's in real world you know yeah so you, you have to like i think i think you should take your idea and define it in how it could be coded so like if you're like oh i want to do this thing that does this crazy thing blah 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 well like break it down into pieces and then implement all those pieces so like i mean you could you can pretty much implement anything any idea you have, and as long as it's not too crazy, like you're not gonna like program like the Iron Man suit or something, but just right, yeah, turn ideas to real world applications. I mean, just you need to have the vision, just break it down into parts and then go from there. Break it yeah. down to the smallest parts possible. So, like we said with the e commerce website, like, oh, how do I make e commerce website? Okay, well then break that down into like you need to be able to see images, you need to be able to have prices, to handle payments, to handle security and privacy, have like accounts and logging in and stuff, just like Amazon.com. Like think, like look at Amazon.com and think of all the parts that it has and then code up all those parts and put them together. Right. Yeah. So whatever it is you're trying to do, then do that. Yep. <laughs> yep. It's just as simple as that. All right, so that is it, guys, for us for today. 
uh, definitely consider jumping into the program, Profitable Programmer. The early bird is ending tonight. So if you have any questions, you can email or ask um, and we will try to answer it for you. You can I'm staying a little bit away from Instagram for just a little bit. So probably not going to be there that much. But yeah, definitely email uh, at support at cleverprogrammer.com. The link is going to be in the description or somewhere for the Profitable Programmer course. I mean, if you're interested in it, I'm sure you'll figure out how to find it. But definitely jump in the program or at least look at the page to see if it's a good fit for you. But the price of this program is going to be going up tonight by $100. So don't wait. Like if you want to get your career started, if you want to grow your income as a freelancer, as a developer, then this is going to be a great program for you. And with that said, this is Kazi. This is Aaron. We love your face and we'll see you in the next video.